Well, welcome everybody. It's great to, to see you all and renewed thanks to the Business School for co-hosting this important talk on India's tiger economy and lessons learned. It's a very relevant subject since, as I'm sure most people here know, India currently holds the presidency of the G20 and meetings are taking place in India as I speak. It also gives us the chance to reflect on the very long ties between Scotland and India and the sometimes complicated relationship both historical and right now. We are indeed very lucky that Lord Billamoria has travelled here and taken time in his busy schedule to be our speaker. He and I share the unique distinction of being sons of generals, which I've no doubt has helped us in our lives. Not only is he a member of the Asia Scotland Institute's Distinguished International Advisory Council, but he was until recently president of the CBI. He's also the Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, a graduate of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, a member of the House of Lords, and the founder of Cobra Beer. Perhaps less well known, he founded the very successful Change the Race Ratio, impacting corporate governance, and is a champion for global Britain. In a time of market disruption, serious international tension at home and abroad, and a multitude of leadership challenges, it is also worth noting that the UK's Prime Minister is the first Hindu and the youngest holder of his office in modern times. His Indian roots should help bridge any cultural divide that there may be with that country. Are there grounds for optimism in the face of global developments with a war raging in continental Europe? Where does India stand in its relations with Russia? I'm sure that Karen Billamoria will lead us through the seeming maze in his talk, after which I look forward to helping moderate a vigorous question and answer session to be followed by a networking reception, as Aidan has said. Karen. Thank you very much, Roddy, and uh, great to see you as always and, and to be with the Asia Scotland Institute, and I'm a proud, proud uh, member of it, patron of it, ambassador for it, and also great to be at the University of Edinburgh. Aidan, thank you so much for your welcome. Um, I've uh, I got a connection with this university because my younger son spent a year here, and it's uh, one of my favorite, favorite um, cities in the world, and I mean that. I always love coming here. Uh, I will talk to you about this title, but I'm going to widen it. And I want you to, in the Q&A, uh, ask me about anything uh, that, you, that you'd like to. I've been a member of the House of Lords now uh, for 16 and a half years. So when I was appointed in 2006, I was the third youngest peer in the House, and I'm still one of the younger peers in the House. <laughs> Our average age is uh, 70. And um, Roy, you mentioned about our Prime Minister. In 2002, I was very fortunate to be awarded Asian of the Year. And in my, in my speech, in my acceptance speech, was, the award was given to me by the then Home Secretary, David Blunkett, a great man, who's now with us in the House of Lords. And in my acceptance speech, I said, in my lifetime, there will be an Asian as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Well, it took two decades, on, and on Diwali Day, 24th of October last year, it actually happened, and Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister of this country. I want to take you back to India in the state of Kerala, in South India, many, many years ago. There were two young brothers. The nearest school in the village they lived in was another village six kilometers away. The older brother got a place in the school, the younger brother didn't. And the younger brother would follow the older brother and sit outside the older brother's classroom window. It was a hut. And the older brother would pass the textbooks through the window to his younger brother. That's the only way he could start to learn. He eventually got into school. He was very clever. 
later got a scholarship to the London School of Economics. It took his family one year just to raise the money for the travel and the clothing for him to come to the LSE. That's how poor they were. He did brilliantly at the LSE, joined the Indian Foreign Service, rose right up through the ranks of the Foreign Service, became an ambassador. And then he became the first Dalit. They used to call them untouchables. The first Dalit president of India, President Narayana. And I had the privilege to know him. His daughter is a friend of mine, Chitra, who also became an ambassador herself. And I tell you that story because that story says that anyone can get anywhere from anywhere, but it also is a story that talks about the power of education. If I set the scene, I'm, I'm a graduate of, so I've, I've got, I went to, University in India when I was 16. I skipped a couple of years. I just a lucky break. And I graduated in 19, came here, qualified as a chartered accountant with, in those days, it's now Ernst & Young, but when I joined, it was Arthur Young McClellan Moores, the biggest firm of accountants in Scotland. And uh, then became Ernst & Young while I was there, EY. And I did a law degree at Cambridge, and I started up my business, um, Cobra Beer. And I thought I had enough education to last a lifetime with two degrees and a professional qualification. But eight years into my business, once the business had started to take off, I started embarking on lifelong learning. And I'm an alumnus of three business schools, of the Cranfield School of Management, of the London Business School, and the Harvard Business School. And I attended Harvard for nine years and went back for refreshers uh, for seven years after that. And one of those years when I went back for a refresher was in 2017, January. And if you remember what had happened in 2016, two things of global significance happened in 2016. One, Brexit. By the way, how many of you think Brexit was a good idea? Anyone? Can I just see a hand? One hand. How many of you think Brexit was a bad idea? Right, that's, yeah. I, I was lecturing at the Royal College of Defense Studies the other day, brigadiers, air commodores, commodores um, from around the world, from over 20 countries. And the same thing happened. I said, how many of you think Brexit was a good idea? One hand went up. And how many think it was a bad idea? All the hands went up, the other hands. So Brexit was a big, big event. Uh, the second big event in uh, 2016 was? Trump. Exactly, Trump. So Professor Ravi Abdullal, um, uh, one of the great, great, political economists in the world uh, gave us a lecture and he analyzed the fault lines of Trump and Brexit and they were identical, absolutely identical. Who voted for Trump and who voted for Brexit? Who voted against Trump and who voted against Brexit? I mean, whether it was rural, urban, educated, not educated, pro-immigration, anti-immigration, whichever way you looked at it was identical. And then he finished off the lecture with a graph that will remain embedded in my memory for the rest of my life. And the graph started off after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 with globalization zero. So it's a graph of globalization. So globalization was zero. You know, Europe had been at war. And um, I'm sorry if there's anyone French, I apologize. But anyway, Battle of Waterloo, Duke of Wellington. And then. There was peace in Europe for a hundred years, and that peace enabled the empires, in particular the British Empire, to really flourish. It also enabled America as a country to rapidly grow, and globalization went all the way, all the way to the top, and peaked in the early 1900s. And then, from nowhere, the First World War took place, a war that should never, ever have happened. There's a book about the build-up to the, f I can't remember the name of the author, it's an American author, the build-up of the First World War, where she describes it's like watching a train crash in slow motion. And this war, devastating war, globalization plummets. And then two years after that, you had the Spanish flu for the two years that followed the war. So globalization rock bottom again. Then it picks up again in between the First and Second World War. Second World War caused by the First World War, globalization plummets again. 
Then the graph picks up again in 1945 after the Second World War, and it rises and rises and rises and rises and rises and rises and rises, and it reaches the peak of the early 1900s in January 2017. And then he does what every economist does. He does a fan chart of the future. These are the possibilities of what could happen. And if history repeats itself, he said, with the protectionism that is building up in the world, we're going to be at war soon. And sadly, his prediction was absolutely right with what we're seeing going on with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So that is the global setting. We have a change in world order where you had two superpowers, the USA and the USSR, and now you have two superpowers, the USA and China, and you have an emerging superpower, India. And just recently, I was in, in India, I was in India, I was with, with Elaine Graham, just, uh, we were there in, uh, in, in January, and then I went back again leading a delegation of the University of Birmingham, came back on Monday, um, and I attended the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, and my friend K.P. Singh won a Lifetime Achievement Award, a great friend of my father's. And one of the people who also received the award um, was Deepak Bagla. Uh, the Consul General is here. Thank you for being here, sir. You know Deepak Bagla, the head of Invest India. And he made a speech. He received an award. He said, look, I'm not an entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, but thank you for the award. And he'd made a speech just before then, which has sort of gone viral, where he spoke about what's happened in India. And he said that the transformation that is taking place in India is the greatest transformation in the history of the free world. In 1750, India made up one quarter of the world's GDP. And then he talks about this, his pillars of change. And he said, the foreign direct investment that India has received from outside the world, from other countries, into India, totals $950 billion dollars since 1947. 532 million, or billion of that has come in the last 19 months, in less than two years. Over half of it has come in less than two years. And there's been a pandemic, by the way, and there's war going on in Ukraine. He said that in eight years, uh, the, uh, from 2015 to 2023, it's been just record. In 2022 alone, it was $83 billion, coming from 162 countries into 61 sectors, into 31 states. And he said 93% of that foreign direct investment has come through what they call in India the open route. I mean, India was the classic license raj, closed economy, protected economy, the India that I was born in and brought up in until I came here at the age of 19. It was a horrible country to live in as a consumer. You had no choice. Three models of cars. You had to wait one year for a telephone line. Um, it was a protected, insular, inward-looking economy going nowhere. And it was the liberalization of India in 1991 that freed up India's economy, freed up the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit of India, and unleashed India's growth. It took about a year, a decade, before India's growth rate started to touch almost double digits of 10%. And India has never looked back. And so he goes on and says that, that the Indian economy is now a $3.5 trillion economy. Um, it took 67 years to become a $1 trillion economy, to prove my earlier point of the in inward-looking insular economy. The second trillion took eight years. Can you imagine? 67, eight. And the third trillion has taken five years. This is the growth rate of India. He said India has now, since 2015, overtaken Russia, Italy, Brazil, France and the UK, and is now the fifth largest economy in the world. And he predicts soon India will overtake Germany and become the fourth largest economy in the world. Uh, two thirds of India's GDP comes from domestic demand. And that means demand that is ahead of supply, driven by the market. 1.4 billion people. And there are 1 billion people aged under 35. And the average age of Indians now is 29 years old. The Indians will generate huge amounts of GDP in their lifetime, the young now. And, in, and, and when we come up to 2042, so in 25 years, um, 
the target, well, like before that, 25 years from now, India predicts that it will have a GDP of $32 trillion, so almost 10 times what it has now in 25 years, and will become the second largest economy in the world. India's politics, the elections that take place in India are phased out, but it's, it's done using electronic voting. Vote. There are 960 in the 2019 elections, 960 million registered voters, of those 960 million, 600 million actually voted. One million polling booths around the country. And 90 million of the people who voted out of the 600 million last time were first-time voters. I mean, this is phenomenal. Uh, the digitization of India, it's the number one in data per capita in the world. Mobile data of India is more than the US and China put together. 41% of the world's real-time transactions are in India, and China is number two, and is half the amount. 48 billion transactions in 2021, China is something like 18 billion. And uh, startups, there are now, it's number three in unicorns. There's um, the new startups in a huge way, at a phenomenal pace. Uh, and in the internet, where it's concerned, it's the second largest user of the net in the world. Three million new, peep, three new people every second join the internet in India, and um, a lot of it is coming from the Indian villages. And then the huge movement, people moving into cities from the rural areas, is going to be a huge urbanization uh, that is taking place. So this is India. This is India on uh, the move, which is absolutely phenomenal. I'm uh, a Zoroastrian Parsi. Does that mean anything to anyone here? Can I see? Yes, of course, to you. Yes. Anyone else? Anyone at the back? Zoroastrian Parsi? No hands at the back? Freddie Mercury of Queen? <laughs> the Tatas? The Poonawalas of the Serum Institute of India, the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world before the pandemic, and of course now after the pandemic. And Cobra Bay, of course, that's a different thing. Um, so, you know, we, we are a tiny, tiny um, community. And Roddy spoke about diversity and inclusion. And I found a change the race ratio as President CBI. So when I was made President CBI, I gave a talk the other day, uh, and the, of a TEDx, a te TED talk. And it was, um, the title of my talk was Luck, Serendipity, and Sliding Doors. And you know, I've attended three business schools that I've told you. I've done hundreds of case studies. I've never done a case study on luck. And the best definition of luck, well, there are two, three definitions I can give you. One is I chaired the Cambridge Judge Business School for, three, for five years until just recently. And one of our professors there, Mark Durand, he says, serendipity is seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. Seeing what everyone else sees, but thinking what no one else has thought. So you say, how serendipitous, how fortuitous. The best effort of luck that I've ever heard is in the Harvard Business School classroom. Luck is when determination meets opportunity. And I picture that as waves that go past you in life. If, you, if you're determined, you might just catch one of those waves. If you're not determined, those waves will just keep going past you all your life. So determination meets opportunity. And then an Indian spiritual leader told me his definition of luck is it's all about timing. If you've got an idea, and you, you've got a phenomenal idea, but the world and the market is not ready for your idea, it's not going to work. And if the world and the market is ready for an idea and you're not ready, it's not going to work. But if you and your idea and the world is ready for your idea and the market is ready for your idea, that's the timing and that's your luck. So it's all about timing. Now, whichever one of those you want to um, apply, I was appointed president of the Confederation of British Industry in 2019, summer, as president-elect. You spend one year as vice president, two years as president, and one year as vice president, which I'm doing now to look after your successor. And the one year that I was spending as vice president shadowing my predecessor, 
um, I made my plans for my two years of presidency as the first ethnic minority president of the CBI in its history, as the youngest president of the CBI in its history, as the first sitting member of the House of Lords as president of the CBI, and as an entrepreneur. Now, those firsts were really wonderful in the first place, but what was not planned was I would be president of the CBI in the biggest crisis since the Second World War. And the pandemic happened just before I started my presidency, lockdown in March, I took over in June, and my presidency was the pandemic followed by the sad war in Ukraine. So I will forever be known as the crisis president. That was not planned. But here's the luck of it. As the crisis president, I was able to operate in a way that my predecessors who normally were older FTSE 100 chairs, very distinguished, very eminent, very experienced, very wise, very capable people, would not have been able to do what I did in those two years of crises. And if I give you two examples, one was when India had its second wave of COVID. Do you remember that tragic time? Well, we have somebody here. You helped out in a big way. Um, you know, we, we, it was, the Indian High Commissioner, you know, sort of lockdown scenario, and the Indian High Commissioner said, I need your help, Karan. Can, can the CBI help? We, we've got people literally dying because of a lack of oxygen. We need generators. We need concentrators. We need cylinders. We need PPE. We may need to build Nightingale hospitals. Can you help? And you know, I rallied around my President's Committee, the Who's Who British Industry, and did we get help? No one said no. They all helped Accenture, British Oxygen, the whole lot. rent a -Kill sent two million pounds worth of product. Pfizer, whose vaccine wasn't even approved in India at that time, $70 million worth of help. And that business being a force for good was just inspirational. Later on, the Indian High Commissioner said the whole world, the help that came from the Indian High Commission was more than any other country in the world. And he said that was thanks to you and the CBI and business and people helping out. The next thing, I mean, lots else happened, but the Ukraine war started on the 24th of February, which was a Thursday. We immediately imposed sanctions. Absolutely. British business including my joint venture partners, Molson Coors, and I stopped doing business with Russia. Stopped exporting, stopped importing, stopped investing, started disinvesting. Fine. It happened straight away. But I said, I've got to do more. There's something that we can do. This is devastating. That weekend, I said to my chief of staff, Omar, I said, Omar, we've met the Ukrainian ambassador before. In fact, he'd been introduced to me to try and increase Ukraine-UK trade. And then I'd met him at COP26 in Glasgow. And Omar said on Saturday, I've got, his, I've got his number two, his deputy's mobile number. He phoned the deputy. The deputy put it on speaker. And Omar said, Lord Bellamar is offering help. Do you need any help? And the ambassador said, please, I need help desperately. Can you ask him to come on Monday morning to see me in the embassy? So I went across to the embassy. And uh, I will the look on the eyes of the ambassador and his deputy. They hadn't slept all weekend. And he, that is when I heard, before the world heard, he said, they thought they would walk in and take over our country in two days. They thought our army, like Afghanistan when the Taliban came in, that they would lay down their arms and the Taliban took over the country. They thought that's what they could have done to us and we have decided we're going to fight. And we have conscripted every 18-year-old and above male, but we don't have things like ration packs. We need help. The next day I returned, and I sat next to him in his office, and we had a screen with the who's who of British industry, and I said, now tell them what help you need. And the next day after that, we had ration packs going to Ukraine. We had medical kits going to the front line. 
later on, supermarkets were being bombed and the breadbasket of the world was running out of food and we got all our retailers together and we said food package is enough for an individual of ambient food to survive for a week, millions of pounds worth. That is British business and business as a force for good. So when I look back on my tenure CBI, I realize it's being able to do that, being in a position to help in a time of crisis and save lives, literally, uh, is phenomenal. And people don't realize how powerful business can be. I just did a television interview from here in the middle of an emergency CBI meeting that I had to take, take part in. And I, I mentioned um, an article that I've written. I'm a, I'm a visiting fellow at the Said Business School at Oxford and at the Center for Corporate Reputation. And I've just written an article. You can look it up. And the title of the article is something along the lines of business and government working in collaboration together, 2 plus 2 equals 5. When business and government work together, it is very, very powerful. And I will give you three quick examples. The furlough scheme. Do you all remember the furlough scheme? So the furlough scheme was announced after lockdown started around that time, 23rd of March, 2020. It was a very innovative scheme, and full credit goes to Rishi Sunak, who was chancellor at the time. And this is basically allowing people in a lockdown situation to not lose their jobs. And it worked. It cost a lot of money, but it worked. But you know, initially, it was brought in in March only until the end of May. Now, you know big companies have to give notice periods of minimum of 45 days. So we said to the Chancellor, when it was coming up, we said, we don't know how long your lockdown is going to last. We're still in lockdown. People are going to be made redundant now. If you don't, if you don't extend this further scheme, oh, okay, we'll extend it to the end of June. So they extended one more month. The lockdown carried on. We said, are you going to keep having this rolling cliff edge where business doesn't know and people are going to be put on notice and redundancies and no certainty? When did the furlough scheme actually end? It carried on until September 2021 because they listened to us. And in one speech I'll remember Rishi Sunak made in the House of Commons and he was restricted by Lindsay Hoyle, the, the Speaker, to four minutes. And the Speaker's all powerful in the House of Commons. In the House of Lords, the Speaker has no power. It's the only self-regulating house in the world, by the way. Nobody controls us. We, if you watch Question Time in the House of Lords, people stand up to speak and we give way to each other. It's quite remarkable. The House of Commons speaker is all powerful, and he gave him four minutes. In those four minutes, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, mentioned the CBI twice and thanked us for our help. So that's one example. Next example, when lockdown was announced, I remember I was one of the early adopters. I got COVID quite early on. And I was in bed all day, and we had a very long CBI meeting, which included recruiting our new uh, Director General to succeed, Carolyn Fairburn, uh, Tony Danker, who, uh, who was selected at that meeting. And I was in bed, literally in bed with COVID, on the phone, on a conference call, the whole day. And when we finished the main of selecting a successor, um, we then uh, went on to other business, which is, of course, dealing with the pandemic. And... Uh, so Carolyn Fairburn said, Karen, you've nearly lost your business three times. You've been through tough times. What is business going to need now in a lockdown situation? I said, very simple. Business is going to need cash. They're going to need cash because they will have no business. They'll have no sales. And they have to pay their employees. The furlough scheme, which came in soon after that, helped a bit. Business rates relief helped, but basically they're going to run out of cash. They'll go to their banks and the banks won't lend them any money because it's too risky, because when's this pandemic going to end? Is lockdown going to continue? The banks are not going to lend. So what they're going to need are loans from the banks, and, and the government's going to have to guarantee the loans. And here I said I'll go one step further. Governments do 85 government loan guarantee schemes. I, at, at Cobra Bay in the early days, we got 85% loan guarantees. I remember how difficult, even in normal times, to get a bank to lend you a government guaranteed 85% loan. The bank didn't want to take the 15% exposure. In a time of COVID, lockdown, they're never going to take that 15% exposure. I said, the money will not flow unless the government guarantees 100%. This, that'll never happen. I said, well, you want my opinion? I'm giving you my opinion. What happened? They started the Siebel's loans, guaranteed over 80% by the government. Money didn't flow. And I persist in this. The other thing about an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs have guts. You have the guts to do it in the first place, 
but you, you have the guts not to give up when others would give up. And you never give up. You persist. And I kept persisting, and I kept saying, we need to 100%, we need 100%. I then got examples from Germany and Switzerland that had started to do 100% guaranteed loans. And eventually I was on question time in April, made the point again on question time, challenged the cabinet minister on question time. The next week, we got the 100% guaranteed loans. Now, there was a problem with those loans, and some people took advantage, and some of them were fraudulent, and I knew that was always going to happen, but 1.6 million businesses got those loans at an average of 30,000 pounds each. And I've met so many small businesses after that who said, thank you, that saved our business. That little amount of 30,000 pounds, along with the other government help, saved our business. That's the second example. The third example, I got told very early on in the pandemic in August 2020 about lateral flow tests from a friend of mine in America. We'd started doing PCR testing, which was meant to be the gold standard. What, what about PCR tests? Very expensive. They take time for the results to come true, but they're meant to be accurate. And I found that these lateral flow tests, the research that I did, they're very cheap. They're not as accurate, but you can get them in, in a huge quantity. So I said, why don't you, instead of lockdowns and mass isolation, have people do regular PCR tests? And I had a case study where I, I, I helped save the Premier League football season, by the way. If you remember with the lockdown, the games were cancelled. I was approached by a testing company that said, look, we're going to put the team and the coaches and everyone into a bubble with spectator-free stadiums, and Birmingham has, university has testing experts. If they can advise us and help us, we'll, put the, we'll test the players regularly. Anyone who gets COVID isolates, and the rest of the players and the coaches carry on. So the, the show doesn't stop. And it worked. If you remember, through the whole pandemic, we had the football season continuing. It was because of that testing that I helped to institute. So I'd seen firsthand how testing people regularly, you could keep things going without mass isolation. Government wouldn't listen. They were rude to me. I would ask, and the advantage I had was to be able to speak on the floor of the House of Lords. The health minister at that time would bat me off. One of my colleagues was the head of testing in, in Zoom meetings. She'd bat me off. Again, you don't give up. And you can look it up at Hansard on the 12th of November, 2020. I asked the question again, and the minister said, Lord Billamora, you have won this argument. We're inspired by you. And what happened after then? They started, in, and I said, once you have, you've got to give it free to businesses and free to individuals, and then you'll be able to prevent lockdowns. Well, they took a long time to listen. Eventually, do you remember in December 2021 and January 2022, we ran out of lateral flow tests, but everyone was using them regularly. And Oxford University did a test in the summer of 2021 with 200 schools, 10,000 children, 10,000 children, 1,000 staff, 1,000 staff, 100 schools followed the regular lateral flow testing. Anyone who tested positive, that individual isolated, everyone else did carry on. The other lot, every time somebody got COVID, the whole bubble would isolate in the way. Do you remember over millions of children were missing out on school? And they proved at the end that there was no difference at all, and people were isolating unnecessarily, and the regular lateral flow tests, they didn't miss out at all. Just imagine if government had listened earlier to me. I say to you, we could have prevented lockdowns two and lockdowns three, and children wouldn't have missed school, and universities wouldn't have missed school. This is the power of business and government uh, working together. So I'm now going to conclude um, just with, a, with a, just a few remarks. Uh, with the Ukraine war, I think that we're in a very serious situation with defense spending in our country. I believe that we need to increase our defense spending. Uh, one of my, my Cambridge contemporaries, uh, Brigadier Justin Majeski, who's the current, Roddy, you probably know, who's current director of the Army Museum next to the Royal Hospital in Chelsea, where I was a commissioner for six years, he wrote an editorial recently where he says, no one wants World War III, but lesson from history is clear. If we want peace, we need to be prepared to fight for it. And he said, Britain is facing a historic crisis that echoes the build-up to the Second World War. I mean, this is pretty scary. And I was in Parliament when President Zelensky came just now, just now, um, and he spoke to us uh, and he, he, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, and he said um, he was going to be meeting King Charles later, and he said, the king is an Air Force pilot, 
And in Ukraine today, every Air Force pilot is a king. And he then presented the speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, with a Ukrainian fighter ace <coughs> pilot's helmet, a lieutenant colonel's helmet, and on it the words were inscribed, we have freedom, give us the wings to protect it. And, and Justin Majeski, he concluded, um, I, I believe, in Duke of Wellington motto, fortune favors the bold, he said, armies need might and mass to win. That means good weapons, good people, and enough of them to be a credible deterrent. Without an effective defense, everything that you tre treasure is threatened. Defeat in war means you lose everything. No health, no pensions, no education, no saf safety. We need to be prepared, and preparation has a price. I spoke at the memorial service of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of the greatest people who's lived on this planet. I had the privilege of knowing him. He's a fellow fellow of Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. My wife is South African. And in the memorial service in my speech, I quoted Archbishop Desmond Tutu in 1988, addressing the South African government. And he said this. So this, remember, Nelson Mandela was released in 1990, and South Africa eventually became a republic in 1994. So he's saying this in apartheid, South Africa, 1988, to the South African government. He said, you have already lost. Let us say so nicely, you have already lost. We're inviting you to come and join the winning side. Your cause is unjust. You are defending what is fundamentally indefensible because it is evil. It is evil without question. It is immoral. It is immoral without question. Therefore, you will bite the dust, and you will bite the dust comprehensively. I made a speech on the 19th of January this year in the House of Lords on the importance of the relationship between the UK and India. And I ended my speech with the following paragraph, which went viral. Some of you may have seen it. I didn't predict it, but it just <laughs> happened to. And I said this. I said, to conclude, as a boy, Naren the Modi sold tea at his father's tea store at a railway station in Gujarat. Today, he is one of the most powerful people on this planet as Prime Minister of India. Today, India has the presidency of the G20. Today, India has a vision to become, in the next 25 years, the second largest economy in the world with a GDP of $32 trillion. The Indian Express has left the station. It is now the fastest train in the world the fastest growing major economy in the world. The UK must be its closest and most trusted friend and partner in the decades ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prash. Inspirational stuff. Thank you. Um, really great. You're quite right when you talk about India having the presidency of G20 now. And we're trying to, of course, I think it's the eighth round, get the free trade agreement with, between the UK and India in place. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Are you optimistic about it? I, well, I, I was very fortunate again as President CBI to take part in the um, free trade negotiations with Australia and New Zealand. And uh, those, that's the first free trade agreement we did was with Australia. And uh, it is the most modern, comprehensive free trade agreement in the world. It covers everything from uh, mobility of young people from 18 to 35 year olds being able to stay for three years in each other's countries, to data, innovation, SMEs, um, tariffs, you name it. Uh, very, very comprehensive agriculture. Uh, and I, I took a very very detailed role in those negotiations. And similarly, I've been very involved with the Indian um, Free Trade Agreement, where the negotiations have now been going on for a year. We've gone through many phases of the FTA with India, and we're hoping for some tariff reductions on the extreme cases of Scotch whiskey. We're in Scotland. I mean, it's a huge export to India. Uh, India is the largest Scotch whiskey market in the world. And uh, if the duties are reduced from 150 uh, percent, the sales would go up significantly. Similarly for cars, the duty for cars in India is 100%. Um, 
so if the, the, the duty reduction, but also uh, if we have more ease of doing business in many other areas. So it, it's, it's, we're trying to make it as comprehensive as possible. Uh, it, it will help the trade increase between our countries. At the moment, our trade between the UK and India is 29 billion pounds. I mean, we, the India is the UK's 12th largest trading partner. So the fifth largest economy in the world is our 12th largest trading partner. We should be doing a multiple of that. So we've got targets to get it up, get it to double it by 2030. In my view, a good free trade agreement will help us to increase our bilateral trade hugely. And it's not just the trade, it's the investment in each other's country. If there is some good investment that's going on. We could increase that investment much more with a good, comprehensive, as possible, free trade agreement. But you've got to be realistic because the per capita income in India compared with our per capita income is not equal. So it cannot be as comprehensive as the Australian free trade agreement, but we can try and get as comprehensive as possible. And of course, Boris Johnson, in his typical style, will get it done by Diwali. Well, you did not get it done by Diwali. It was completely unrealistic. And it's not good to rush something like this through. Uh, it's better we take more time and get a good deal in the best of spirits. And by the way, what's linked to that is also immigration. And unhelpful remarks from our Home Secretary about immigration have not helped. Um, unhelpful remarks about students. So I'm, I, I see myself as the head of international students in the UK. I'm co-chair co of the all-party parliamentary group on international students. I'm president of the UK Council for International Student Affairs. It looks after the interests of every international student in this country, including in this university. And I helped to bring in the two-year post-graduation work visa in 2007-2008. It was taken away by Theresa May in 2011-2012. We then fought very hard for it to be brought back in. It was brought back in by Boris Johnson. What has happened? The number of Indian students as a result alone, Indian students have overtaken the Chinese and now the number when international students 129,000. We asked the government to set a target for international students. They listened. They set a target of 600,000. We hit 600,000 in the pandemic. We're now at 690,000. I think we should go up to a million. And then you have remarks about we need to reduce international students. And what a lot of nonsense is that? In, in international students, money alone is 30 billion pounds, if not more. But far more important is they enrich the experience of our universities and the experience of our domestic students. I'm the third generation of international students from India in this country. My, my grandfather, both my grandfathers, one was at Sandhurst, one was at Birmingham University. My, my mother was at Birmingham University. Her brother did his PhD, went to IIT Madras, and came to Birmingham University to his PhD in engineering. And I studied at British University, and now two of my children have graduated from British University. One of them was at Edinburgh, is now continuing studies at another British University. So four generations. The, the generation long links, there were more world leaders that have been educated at British universities and American universities than any other country in the world by far. Four Indian prime ministers have been educated at British universities. Four Indian prime ministers. I mean, this is really powerful. And you say you want to reduce the number of international students. Why? Because we include international students in our net migration figures. Why? Because the United Nations say that anyone who stays in the country, in a country, in any country in the world for one year, is classified as an immigrant. And of course, any international student is going to stay here for at least one year with, with a one-year master's. You'll be here for one year. But what, what a lot of nonsense. In, in, international students are not immigration immigrants, they go back to their countries, or they will stay on a legitimate way to work. So we have said, send the UN figures with international students classified as immigrants, but internally exclude them from your net migration figures. That's what many of our competitor countries do. Will the government listen? They're not listening so far. And it goes back to my old thing, business and government working together in collaboration, two plus two equals five. If they don't listen, it doesn't work. Uh, but I don't give up, and I'll keep trying. Karen, wonderful stuff. Now, let's get some questions. I'm sure there are many in the audience. What we'll do is we'll do two at a time. So who would like to kick off? If you could say who you are and ask a question. Yes. Hello, I'm Laura McKenzie, friend of Roddy's. And um, I was just going to ask, uh, it's not on the economy, but um, Narendra Modi... Uh, what do you make of this Hindu nationalism and what it might do for the economy in India? Thank you. Not do. Right, good. And a second question. Gentleman there on the left. Yep. Um, my name is Ben. I'm a final year IR student here at Edinburgh. Um, just say thanks very much for the, the talk. I found it very interesting. I guess partly 
kind of following up from from the lady's question, I I bring you back to what you were saying about the Ukraine war. I, I found that very interesting, and I just wondered what your perspective is on kind of bringing India more more in line with the rest of the West on on the sanctions. And I guess that kind of ties in um, to to the lady's Modi question, um, and also just. On that Ukraine war as well, I found it interesting reading at the time about your kind of bid to potentially buy Chelsea with a with a group of people. So I just wonder, perhaps, how much, you know, how far that went and what what it's kind of like to to try and buy a football club. I feel like that's yeah. something with, which people <laughs> are, we're constantly reading about, and it's probably quite a big feature of the UK economy, especially internationally. But something that's very kind of behind closed doors, I, I think. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. So on on the. Uh, on the point of Narendra Modi, what, what I mean, I, I met him, I first met him when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat because the in Indian government started in 20 years ago to have this very big event called the Pravasi Bharati Divas where they brought together the overseas Indians back to India for a th usually three-day conference. And uh, they would invite the Chief Ministers of the States to attend, Cabinet Ministers would take part, and it was a way to get the now 30 million overseas Indians like me to engage with their motherland and uh, to, you know, to invest back in India, to help India, to be ambassadors for India. Very good idea. It was brought in by the first BJP government, by uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, uh, who was a, a wonderful man. Um, and he, he brought this initiative. And I used to meet Narendra Modi when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat at these events. He used to come for them. And of course, I'm a Zoroastrian Parsi, and the Parsi settled in Gujarat. Right. Yes, so I've, I've known him. What, what I have seen is, as, as a leader, the difference he has made to India in terms of putting India on the global stage um, has been phenomenal. The statistics that I quoted to you earlier of India's progress, um, it's with him as a leader that all this has happened. Uh, so you have to give him credit for all that. Now, when it comes down to the Hindu nationalism or the, the, what you spoke about, uh, what peop some people are concerned about, um, I think that th the reality on the ground is, as things stand, the Indian constitution is a pretty robust constitution. It still has an independent judiciary. It still has the rule of law. And the reality also is that Narendra Modi is prime minister of India, but the BJP is not in charge of every single state in India. So if you go down to the southern states, they are not with the BJP. And India's federal system is very well structured so that they run in a pretty autonomous way um, in India. And they, I mean, you look at a state like Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is flying as a state. I was there recently. The University of Birmingham has set up a joint degree with IIT Madras. And IIT Madras is the number one academic institution in India today. I mean, the students at the IIT, I don't know if you know, but 1.5 million students sit the first entrance exam. The first cut is 150,000 students, and then 15,000 get a place at the, what are they now, 23 IITs? And of those IITs, IIT Madras is now currently ranked number one. So we've got a joint Birmingham University master's degree in AI and data science, where the students spend time at both universities and come out with a joint degree. And that's the stage to which we are taking things. But Tamil Nadu is not run by the BJP. Uh, you know, neither in many other states. Andhra Pradesh is not. Telangana is not. So th that federal system of in, in India really works. And so if you take, and, and the, the point about India is you, if Hindus, of course, are by far the, the, the highest number. But you've got Muslims, hundreds of millions of Muslims. You've got other minorities, like my tiny minorities, and Christians. It has always been a pluralist, secular country at heart. Well, it's always been the intention. And in practical terms, if you take all the opposition parties, <laughs> the, nu the numbers of people who are not ruled directly by, they don't have BJP, BJP states, you have hundreds of millions of people. Um, so you know, I'm, I have a lot of faith that Hindus will always be the majority in India, the vast majority in India, but in India has always been a pluralist, secular state. Um, we mentioned the story about you know, Abdul Kalam, President Abdul Kalam. I mean, he's a Muslim uh, president of India. He's been a phenomenal, the most popular president of India ever. Well, let me tell you a quick story of Abdul Kalam, if you'll um, indulge me. And, and then we must I've got those two questions one. as well. Yep. But Abdul Kalam, um, when I joined the House of Lords in 2006, soon after that, 
um, my, one of my colleagues and a great hero of mine is Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, uh, who uh, was president of the Royal Society you know, for Scientists, the most eminent, uh, had the letters FRS after your name. And he was uh, also Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. And he said, look, Karen, I need your help. We're giving the King Charles Medal, which has only ever been given to one other person before, because it has to be given to a head of state or former head of state who's a scientist. And we've given it once before to the Emperor of Japan, and we're now giving it to President Abdul Kalam. And he's coming over to the Royal Society. We're going to have a special ceremony. And uh, I'd just like you to be with me to host him. And they brought out Isaac Newton's papers, because Isaac Newton was a former president of the Royal Society. And there they had these in Isaac Newton's own hand, his books and his workings and his calculations. His exhibition was fabulous. And uh, we're walking around. And in the middle of it, I suddenly, I, I, I don't know what came out. I said, Mr. President, I met him before. So what, when, where did it all start for you? And the whole entourage stopped. And he said, well, Karen, it started with me when I was an 11-year-old boy in Rameshwaram. And Rameshwaram is a little island in between India and Sri Lanka. And he said, I was a very poor family. I went to the local school, and I had a really good teacher. And at the age of 11, he drew on the blackboard a picture of a bird and explained the concept of flight. And he said, I was mesmerized. I wanted to know more about flight. I wanted to know more about physics, and I wanted to know more about science. Of course, he ended up being a scientist. He ended up being a rocket scientist and a space scientist and headed India's space program and then became the most popular president of India ever. And it started with one teacher. The power of teaching, I think, and Abu Kalam taught me that lesson. Now, to answer your, your, your questions about uh, India and Ukraine and where it stands. See, India's position is a very delicate position. It's always had uh, a non-aligned attitude over the years. I mean, it's very much an emerging global superpower, which is acknowledged now. But India has problems with its neighbors on an ongoing basis, uh, serious problems. And with China, India's situation with China, India has always had a, had a war with China in 1962. It's had three wars with Pakistan. Um, so India's got real problems at its doorstep. And Russia has historically been an ally of India's when America, historically, was an ally of Pakistan. So even if you look at the time of the liberation of Bangladesh, the Americans were, the Pakistanis had American equipment, the Indians had Russian equipment. Uh, so, but now, of course, the world has moved on, and India and the United States of America have a closer and closer relationship. Um, but India just has to be very careful. In Russia, to this day, 60% of India's armaments are Russian. Uh, so. They, you know, it's getting India building its own planes, its own tanks, its, 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 its defense machinery is coming along in a long way. They want to collaborate with the UK much more in defense going forward as well. And India has now joined Quad, which is the United States of America, Australia, Japan, and India. And I want the UK to join Quad, to circle the world. So we should, I, I believe we should do more and more joint exercises. There's an exercise starting right now, this month, called uh, Operation Cobra. Cobra Warrior. Uh, and Cobra Warrior is a joint exercise between the Indian Air Force. They're sending over their Mirage aircraft to take part with our Air Force and one or two other countries. So the more we work together, I think, is very important. And Chelsea Football Club, please don't talk about Chelsea Football Club. We're, we're doing so badly. Um, and, and my consortium that I was, um, I, I was part of uh, with, with American, three American billionaires, uh, we were the front runners. And then they got scared at the last minute. In fact, I woke up the day after the bids were due in with phone calls from Chicago saying, I'm so sorry, Karen, we decided to pull out. And they got scared. Uh, and they said we were told very clearly by the merchant bank, the investment bank, leading the sale that we were the front runners. And I was meant to be put in as chairman of Chelsea in a year's time. So very disappointing. They lacked the Billy Moria spirit to keep going. <laughs> right, two more questions, please. Gentlemen, right there at the back. And here as well. Say who you are, please, and ask Hi, sir. Question. My name is Rudraksh, and I'm a student OEM from India. I'm a student at the business school. My question is that uh, you were talking about the Parsi community doing a lot. Like Tata's has done, done a lot. But everyone's talking about service industries right now. No one's talk, probably talking about manufacturing as an industry which probably has a lot of potential. What is your take on what's going to be the future for manufacturing probably in the UK and in India and in the world uh, as a whole? Thank you. The manufacturing industry question. And then the gentleman down here. 
Uh, yeah, so um, Gordon, I run a small, uh, small startup uh, in, the, in the UK and also in India. Uh, and we, it's called Enod. We, we analyze air quality in urban areas, and uh, it is a very big market for us. Uh, so uh, on that, I'm quite really interested in in the free trade agreement and where where we can protect the the, the resources of countries like it, India. So if we linked the protection of the environment in the free trade, which I know is not really happening. I'm just wondering if that's, that's something that we can, what your view of, of linking doing trade to the protection of the environment. Thank you. The free trade so in the FTA, having something on the environment as an important element. So manufacturing Great. and yeah. free trade. So Thank you. Um, the manufacturing, again, we are UK 80% manufacturing. I mean, it's services, 80% services. Our manufacturing in the UK, I chair the Manufacturing Commission in, in, in Parliament, and we were 30% of GDP manufacturing in the 1970s. Now we've come down to 10%. But that 10% still makes us one of the top 10 manufacturers in the world in absolute terms. And the quality of our manufacturing is still, in most cases, <coughs> world class. So whether it's our aerospace, you know, the Rolls-Royce engines, We've done the big deal with Air India and Tata's now for the Rolls-Royce engines, which is great news. Whether it's our um, um, aerospace, the wings that we make for Airbus, uh, whether it's Formula One uh, cars, automobile industry is absolutely fantastic here in manufacturing. Our beer is best in the world. <laughs> Cobra has won 135 gold medals. Um, a lot of it's manufactured in the UK. So we, we are world-class manufacturers, uh, but it's only 10%. And I think one needs a balanced economy. You can't just go all services. Even our agriculture, you need to promote, even though agriculture is 2% of our economy, but we need to make sure we have a robust, good agricultural. Um, from a self-sufficiency point of view, you need to be an element of self-sufficiency. And, and of course, manufacturing, when it comes to climate change and renewables, uh, wind power. We, we're a world leader in wind power. At the University of Birmingham, we got a Queen's Award a few years ago, and um, it's given for a particular project at a particular university. Like the University of Edinburgh has won Queen's Awards over the years. We won it for our railway department because the University of Birmingham has a world-class railway department. <coughs> and I remember Buckingham Palace, the Queen and Prince Charles, now King Charles, came around to meet the winners. And I was talking to Prince Charles, and the professor, Clive Roberts, was there, who's a world authority on railways. And I said, I said sir, he's, he's developing a hydrogen-powered train. There's a model in the laboratory at the moment in the engineering department. And I joked and I said, one day we'll power the royal train with hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And we all laughed. <coughs> Fast forward a few years, COP26 in Glasgow. Prince Charles was on board Hydroflex, the world's first retrofitted hydrogen-powered train developed by the University of Birmingham in collaboration with Siemens and Porterbrook and manufacturing companies and government help, a world first. And, and so you know, that ability of innovation of universities and business working together with government support, manufacturing could be a real powerhouse. And now India has just put out a tender this week for, I think, 17 hydrogen trains. And we're going to be front of the queue because we were the world first. So I think there's a lot of potential. India has a target of manufacturing to be a minimum of 20%. The quality of manufacturing you can see in India World class. India, next door to Bangladesh. I was in Bangladesh in October last year. I went around one of the largest garment factories in the world. Not just garment factory. It was set on a 300-acre site with 40,000 employees. State-of-the-art machinery from Turkey and Italy. Latest innovation. And it was from a bale of cotton making the actual fabric to the actual garments. And they supply everyone from Zara to H&M huge multi-billion dollar state-of-the-art in Bangladesh. So South Asia's manufacturing capability is now world-class. I have a lot of faith. Um, on the climate change. So the next, yeah. yeah, the question about the things like air quality and pollution and climate change, India is now very, very far ahead in solar power. So they're seen as a world leader in solar power. They're putting a huge priority to hydrogen. I personally feel that if we can have green hydrogen is one of the solutions, zero emissions. Nuclear. We've got the ability here with Rolls-Royce with our small modular reactors. Now, that's another one where I'm like a stuck record with the government. Come on, why aren't we starting them? A small modular reactor 
is six times smaller than a big, giant, size world type nuclear plant. Those ones take decades to build. These can be built in five years. They're much cheaper. They can give enough electricity for a million people. Government's not listening. They're just not listening. We should be starting building them now. We can partner with countries like India. They can build them as well. So the collaborative possibilities are huge. When we had the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham last year, we sponsored the Baton Relay. The Baton went to every 72 countries and territories of the Commonwealth, and it measured the air quality and sent it live to our, um, our air quality pollution expert professors at the university. <coughs> and, and we've done collaborative research with universities in India on air pollution, which is a serious problem in cities like Delhi. Mm -hmm. So the more we work together uh, on this, and India is acutely aware of it, uh, India's made a commitment to net zero by 2070. India's got staging posts of decarbonization that is committed to. So India's very much on the path. We're, we're, we're the first country to legislate for 2050 net zero. So I think we're on the same page, and we've got to work together. But most important point, it's a transition. It's not an on-off switch. This is a transition. We're not going to go off fossil fuels overnight. We've got a transition through. And the Ukraine war has shown us as well, in terms of self-reliance, I think it's turbocharged the need for renewables more than ever. Karen, thanks. Yeah, we're trying our best. We are trying our best to get as much in the free trade agreement as possible. Next question. Lady here. And the gentleman there. Thank you. A really interesting presentation. Um, one cheeky question, if I may, and then could a you say, one. Could you say who you are? Sorry, please. Susan Murray, the David Hume Institute. Um, I uh, love living to, listening to you. I think you've got a really calming voice, and I think that's brilliant. But you've talked in, about inspiring the next generation and a lot about young people and stories. And I wondered, if you could read any CBeebies bedtime story to inspire young people, what would it be? So that's my light-hearted one. Um, and the, the, you've also talked about the federal structure in India, and I wonder if there's lessons there that the UK could learn for operating more efficiency. Thanks very much. And then there's a gentleman back there. Yep. Hello. Uh, I'm Swapnil, the student at the university. So my question is that in the, after the free trade agreement is signed, what, which sectors and industries do you think will play a major role in multiplying the UK and India trade? So that would be quite insightful to know. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yep. Great. Dead time um, stories. Dead time stories. Now, <laughs> and, and, and what age group are you talking about? Um, primary school. Primary school. There was a story. Now this is, I mean, if you ask me a question like that, I'm going to give you a not serious answer. <laughs> um, I invented this character called Superdog. And I used to tell my nephews and my younger cousins uh, stories about Superdog. And, and Superdog would rescue Indian princesses who would be attacked, uh, attacked by evil people. Um, and Superdog was a hero. But now, um, Dr. Lalbani, who owns Vita Biotics, has brought out a tablet superdog, so he's stolen my, my, <laughs> my character. Um, uh, in terms of federal structure, uh, federal structure, India has a very good federal structure. Now, you could argue, uh, if you speak to a finance minister of one of the states in India, they will say, well, we don't get a fair allocation, because federal stru structure will always mean defense, foreign service, whatever happens is center. But everything else can be devolved to the federal system. But taxes, you have state taxes and you have central taxes. And when you get central taxes, on what basis do you allocate those central taxes? By population, by one state doing really well, one state really poor, who subsidizes whom? It's a, it's a very subjective area. And people invariably are not happy. And the a level of autonomy that a chief minister has given um, in a federal system. So I think India's got a good federal system. America's got a very good federal system. Uh, in America, again, look at, the, look at the structure of their federal system where each state has two senators, whether you're a state of California, which is one of the biggest economies in the world, or whether you're a Midwest state, which is one of the tiniest economies in the world, you still have two senators. And Alaska has two senators. Or Rhode Island. You know, or, so th is that fair? <laughs> but you know, it's the way it's been structured. So I think with a federal system, there will always be subjectivity. We seem to have a sort of halfway house here, where we were devolved to Scotland and devolved to Northern Ireland, which, and devolved, Northern Ireland is the most complicated of all of them. And if we want to talk about the Northern Ireland Protocol, I mean, I always said, I was, John Major and I were the only two people in the beginning 
who even mentioned Northern Ireland in the Brexit debate. And I said Northern Ireland is the Achilles heel of Brexit because logically it is a circle that cannot be squared without compromise. And that's exactly what's turned out. Seven years later, we still haven't resolved it. Mm. Uh, so to have a federal system, we don't have a federal system. For a start, we've got a central parliament, which I sit in, but England doesn't have its own parliament. So you know, it's a bit illogical that Wales has one, Scotland has another one, but England doesn't have one. But we're meant to have the central parliament as the English parliament, but no, it's the parliament for everyone. So you know, our, I think we need to evolve our devolution. We made a start with Tony Blair did in, after 1997, but I don't think we've got it right. Uh, and I think we can, we can go further. And we, again, we, it's, it's a sort of, we've got these devolved mayors, elected mayors. Some of them are, good, are doing a good job. Some of them are not. Uh, but but let's, let's, let's see what happens. But I do think there is scope for improvement. And the second question? Sorry, one other point. Second. We don't have a written constitution as well. Now, that's the beauty of this country. This unwritten constitution that goes back 800 years as a thin thread that is continuing evolving in conventions. Like in the House of Lords, 20% of the House of Lords have to be independent crossbench peers like me. No other parliamentary chamber in the world has a, a, a necessity for 20% to be independent. It's a wonderful thing that's just evolved through convention. Um, Brexit. We, with Brexit would, in many ways, with a written constitution, would have required a two-thirds majority. We don't have that. We don't have a written constitution, so we don't have that. So it's got pros and cons, and I think our unwritten constitution is phenomenal. The House of Lords, I'm appointed for life. Now, you'd say, well, come on. You have no accountability, you have no responsibility, you have no constituency, but I see it, our unelected House is a cornerstone of our democracy. So thank you. These are great questions. Now, the second question that you've got was about which sectors. Is that right? No, yeah. I've, done, I've answered the questions. No. You've, yeah, yeah, you answered the sec Did yeah. he answer your question? Yes. Good. OK, good. We'll take two oh, more. Oh, no, no. Oops. Sorry, no, no. I, didn't, no, I didn't. didn't answer your question. I answered your question. I haven't yes. answered your question. Sorry. So, so, so your question with sectors. But, you see, the, the answer to this is, in my view, there is scope for every possible sector in India. Because if you go to India now, you literally it's being, it, don't you think, it's buzzing. It's, act, it's, it's it, yes, of course, the, 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 the tech and fintech and ed tech and food tech. Um, I've got a new business that I'm launching in food tech, by the way. Here's a little uh, uh, announcement ahead of the game. But I see great potential for my idea in India, in my, my food tech idea. But in, in every area, in manufacturing, there is enormous potential. In renewables, huge potential in India. Agriculture. I, I chaired an initiative at Cambridge University where we uh, had, it's called Tigris, if you look it up, T-I-G-2, number two R-E-S-S, to increase crop yield and the second green revolution in India. For a few million pounds, we brought in cross-departmental research, not just plant scientists. Howard Griffiths, who's one of the world plant scientists, headed it <coughs> from Cambridge. But we had anthropologists, we had archaeologists, we had economists, all working together to increase crop yield. And it's been phenomenally successful. So lots of potential. Okay. We'll take two more questions, and then what we're going to do is go outside afterwards. Uh, there's a lady in the striped jersey. Can, do, do, do you mind, Roddy, if I may yes. just... I don't, sure. I don't want anyone to be deprived. So who wants to ask a question, put your hand up, and we'll try and get you all in. There's one, two, three, four, five. That's it? Yes? Right. Okay. okay, can we take those in lots Pro of two? Thank we you. certainly can. Thank you. Yeah. Ask the, say who you are, ask the question, and then we'll rattle on. Okay? Let's we'll start with the lady there. And if you put your hand up before, stick it up again. Yep. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I couldn't be... Could you say who you are, please? Yeah, sorry. My name is Gur Meher. I am from New Delhi, India. Um, I'm studying Master's in Human Resource Management at the university here. Uh, again, repeating, couldn't be more proud of my country while being a part of this audience today. Definitely the first time being in the UK. This is the proudest moment ever. Um, thank you so much for touching upon the diversity that India has um, in terms of its states. Uh, so while you highlighted the economy of India, since you touched the diversity, which implies that every city has a different economy in itself, right? Um, I want to ask a question around the softer elements of the country, which are more like human rights, because I feel that it's more like people from India come abroad, whether it's like the occupation or academics, more for the softer elements of it, right? That how, how people are more human here, how people value humans. 
So how do you think we can, uh, I mean, UK as a country can bridge the gap between how people are perceived in abroad universities or in, uh, in abroad and in India? Because I feel that's the biggest gap that I see as a nation. I know we are doing great at numbers. I know we'll, we might be number one in the coming years. And I'm sure we'll do that. But how do we bridge the gap as being more human as a country? The human and human rights gap, right? Another Thank question? You. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen there. Hi there, my name's uh, Matthew. I'm an innovation consultant. Um, my question was um, about your speech. You mentioned in the lead up to your presidency uh, for CBI that you kind of set out a two-year roadmap that then almost got a bit superseded with all these crises that went on. Um, was there anything in that roadmap that you didn't get the chance to achieve? Um, and what is it that, you know, had it been less of a busy time, um, you would have liked to have uh, achieved that, that might have been missed? Okay. If you're okay, Karen, we'll go on and take a third. Yeah. Who else had their hands up? Yep. Gentleman at the back there. And then we'll come back for the other two or three, which made up the five. Yep. Yep. Good evenings. My name is Shekhar, and I have two questions for you, sir. So my first question is, uh, so in your speech, you had said, I mean, you have mentioned that you have, uh, in addition to the three business schools, uh, you have also done your chartered accountancy course. Yes. So with respect to that, uh, Recently, India has, I mean, our ICAI has signed an MOU with the ICAEW. So what is your suggestion for chartered accountants in India uh, who after this signing of this MOU will come to the UK and how they can do, uh, engage it to their practice and perform here very well because <coughs> establishing a practice coming all the way from India is not a, a small thing for uh, anybody. Uh, my second question to you is, in our CA course itself, we have studied something which is known as Pareto analysis, the concept of 80-20. So this uh, wonderful title of our today's discussion, India's Tiger Economy, based on the concept of Pareto analysis, uh, how do you analyze the Indian economy? Because is it uh, like, I mean, can you just elaborate it with respect to Pareto analysis? Thank you. Okay, let's take those three, and then we'll come back in a minute for the, the next lot. Okay, um, if I can find my notes. There we are. So the first one was on the human, you said about the human. I, I, I think that India is uh, literally advancing in leaps and bounds. And if you if you look at so many things in India I think that we take for granted um, uh, that India was, was ahead of the game. I mean, India had a, a woman prime minister before the UK did, you know, Indira Gandhi. Uh, the UK has had a woman prime minister three times. And the United States still hasn't had an American woman president. So you know, in, in India, there, there are lots of the, the family values that are there in India that we, we take for granted. Um, if, you, if people ask me about Asian values over here, and, and Rishi Sunak, by the way, maybe he's heard me say it, but he says it as well, um, that the, the, the value of family, the value of education, uh, and hard work. So uh, you know, I, in, in, in India, um, when it comes to education, I think that the new education policy of the government is a big breakthrough. We've been crying out for years saying, allow foreign universities to open up in India. It will increase the capacity, it will help the quality, it will help Indian education, and now it's happening. The top 500 universities in the world in the QS rankings can now open up in India. And there will be lots of foreign universities that will open up in India. Uh, we've done, with Birmingham, we've opened a campus in Dubai. And the campus in Dubai has got number one students are from India. 66 nationalities in the first year. And you get a same quality degree you get from Birmingham in the UK in Dubai. And the same quality degree you'll get in India when foreign universities open up in India. <coughs> I think that's going to make a huge difference as well. So I'm, I'm very confident uh, that, that, that that will happen. And in India, soft power, by the way. India has so much soft power uh, that we take for granted. Its culture in terms of its classical music, its theater, 
uh, let alone the film. I mean, it's not just Bollywood, it's Tollywood. It's all the regional cinemas around the Indian, in, Indian music is, is huge. Um, Indian family values, the way uh, Indians look after their elders, uh, I think is, is amazing, is absolutely amazing. I see it in my own family. Uh, so there are a lot of wonderful things about India that I think we take for granted uh, as well. Um, and if you want to follow up, we'll talk about it in, in, the, in, 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 in there. Uh, the, the other point about um, Matthew, you asked about what my plans were and what did I not. Um, so my, my agenda, I wanted to uh, champion entrepreneurship. I don't think I got a chance to do that as much as I would have liked to. I wanted to have universities and business working together, championing that, which I did in a big way. Um, I wanted to, and also I was a CBI president, the only one I think in history that I know was who was sitting university chancellor and had two f and fellowships at Oxford and Cambridge. So it helped a lot being fully engaged in the university sector. So that I did. Um, I wanted to champion global Britain. I think I did that in a big way. Um, and I wanted to do diversity and inclusion as the first ethnic minority president of CBI. And Roddy mentioned I started this initiative. Look it up, change the race ratio to champion ethnic minority mm -hmm. di diversity and inclusion across all businesses. FTSE 100, FTSE 250, Exco, Exco minus one in companies, uh, disclosing the gender, the uh, ethnic minority pay gap. You know, that's a horrible that there's an ethnic minority pay gap. It shouldn't exist. The gender pay gap reporting is compulsory. Ethnic minority pay gap reporting is not compulsory to this day. It should be compulsory. And finally, inclusion. Diversity without inclusion is useless. So that I was able to do in a big way as well. So in spite of the crisis, I managed to do three out of four. <laughs> That's right, thank you. And then the next question was, uh, the next question was the CA, the CA question. Now, I know that the Institute of Chartered Accounts in India is very, very similar qualification as a qualified chartered accountant here in the same way that the Chartered Accounts in Scotland is different to ICAW and is robust, fantastic. You know, Scottish accountants always were world famous. So I don't see why, with this MOU signed, it should be a mutual recognition of qualifications. There's very little adapting to do. The practices are the same. The principles are the same. Um, you know, now increasingly with Indian companies having to deal with US GAAP, with international companies, multinationals <laughs> operating in India, the, the, the qualification demands that you're able to do all that. Uh, so I think that uh, it should be the case. It should be mutual, mutual, mutual recognition. But here's the problem. Foreign lawyers to this day are not allowed to practice in India. And I've tried so hard. From the time I was the chairman of the UK India Business Council, and the Bar Council in India is, is stopping that. And the foreign lawyers are practicing in India, but have to do it not officially. Uh, it would be such an advantage to India to have foreign lawyers. We have the best lawyers in the world here in the UK to be able to collaborate with Indian lawyers. We could say, OK, you can't practice in court. You can't be an advocate in court. Fine. But allow the advisory work to go on, uh, which is so, so important. So, and then the Pareto, well, on that, you see, are you, uh, is your question is, how equally spread is India's economic development sector by sector? He's nodding, I think. Not your question. Who's got the mic so we can hear it? If you could ask your question quickly, because then I want to get on to the last few people. Thank you. Actually, this analysis focuses on the wealth distribution across the uh, entire population. Yeah. So it was firstly invented by Alfredo Pareto. In no, no, I, know, I know the Pareto, yeah. but I'm just saying what context are you asking? Well, wealth inequality? Yeah. Okay. When it comes to wealth inequality, there's no question about it. We're a very unequal society over here, and India's got a lot of inequality as well. So there, that is a huge challenge, for, and I know this speaking to any state finance minister, state chief minister, everyone wants to not only alleviate poverty, and India's done a phenomenal job in getting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but India's historically had the very, very wealthy and the very, very poor, and now what's happening is the very, very poor is being eliminated altogether, but the very, very wealthy is still very, very wealthy, which has historically been the case. But we have that over here in this country as well. If you look at the top 1% of taxpayers in this country, 
uh, pay over 25% of the tax. The top 10% pay over 50% of the tax. We have a progressive tax system over here as well, but it's yeah. still very unequal <coughs> as, as a society even here That's in the UK. That's what, sir, my question is, in spite of that, can we call it as tiger economy just because few people are... No, I, I hear your point. We're looking at it overall as economy, and then you can have the argument about trickle down, that if you create wealth, will that create employment, which will create jobs, which will also... Be, be good, you know, so the more wealth creation there is, the better it is for the economy, the better it is for job creation. So You can continue the question uh, afterwards outside with a drink if you want. I now want to pick up, finally, the last the few the last two hands, were they? Where were these Stick two? up your hand if you had the question before. Yeah. Right. Gentlemen there and here. Thanks. Say who you are and ask the question. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name's Jake Sanders and I'm a third year business student here at Edinburgh. Um, I just wanted to ask, because um, you talked in your talk about um, the kind of connection, the really powerful connection between the UK and India um, in terms of education. And um, I just wanted to ask um, what kind of attitudes um, by businesses and individuals in India are to the free trade agreement that we're potentially going to have between the two countries? Thank you. Hi, my name is Luke. Uh, I'm a consultant at a sovereign advisory firm and a friend of the Institute. Uh, my question is around the war in Ukraine. And you mentioned during your talk something that I think is really important, and that is business and government working in unison. Unfortunately, in the Ukrainian context, we haven't always seen this. Western businesses still operate in Ukraine Western components are still being found in Russian military equipment in Ukraine. I wonder what positive role can the CBI and other industry association groups play in educating their members about the unique risks that Russia poses to those businesses uh, in terms of war crimes complicity, terrorism financing, money laundering risks, and particularly risks around the mobilization order, and how industry associations like the CBI can play that positive role in getting their members on board. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Right, Karen. Last two questions. Um, the, the, you see, the attitude to the FTA, this is something where, which is very important, where people can be pretty skeptical and say, well, you know, how am I going to benefit from this? And the, this is where it's the job, once the free trade agreements are signed, it's the job of both countries and their business organizations uh, to get the message out so that people take advantage of the free trade agreement and make the most of all the, the changes uh, that, is, that are there. And, and that is a job that has to be done. It's, it's an awareness-raising job, um, and, and of course, if you look at it stepping back from it, if it does increase trade flows and investment, then everyone benefits from it. Uh, so the, the, the proof of it is actually in making it work. Uh, and I think we will see the difference. Now, the moment tariffs go down, everyone will be very happy. If an Indian who loves Scotch whiskey can buy it cheaper, they're going to be very happy. So, you, know, so it, 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 you, you can see some benefits come through straight away. Others of ease of doing business they may take a little longer time to flow through. Uh, but in both cases, it should be should be much easier. And just one point on that: Do you think that um, we'll see a lot more um, UK business in India after a trade agreement? Much more, much more. There, that we've done an Grant Thornton bring out an analysis of Indian companies investing in the UK. It's called the Tracker. The, look it up. Look up the Grant Thornton Tracker. The Tracker report this way: Indian in, Indian business in the UK, an analysis of the how many billions they, they generate, how many thousands of people they employ, what they contribute to the UK. And they do it the other way, UK companies in India. The average growth rate in their last report was 26%. And the top companies were growing at over 100%. Dyson was growing at over 100% in India. So the potential is huge. And these tracker reports show, just imagine after an FTA, we'll be able to measure how much more that turbocharges those investments, let alone the, the, the trade flows. Um, the war in Ukraine. Uh, we'll end with this one. And I think my view is very simple on this. I think that it, British business has on the whole been pretty good in stopping doing business with, with Russia. 
But there are, you know, what if you get Russian oil that goes to another country, is refined over there, and then sold back to the West? That's happening. You know, how do you control this? Uh, it's very difficult, but if you have the attitude that we don't want to do business with Russia, we have the sanctions, we're going to enforce the sanctions, that's the most important thing. And then there's the attitude, the war is now one year old. How much do we support? So we support it in a humanitarian way, which I spoke about in my speech. We supported Britain as the second largest defense supporter after America with over three billion pounds worth of support that we've given in weaponry, uh, in anti-tank weaponry. Now we're giving tanks. Other countries are giving tanks. The ni next request is for airplanes and aircraft. Now, where do we stop? And I think that it's got to the stage that we need to support Ukraine completely. Because in this, I've consulted some of my professors at Harvard about this. One is very negative about it, very negative, who thinks Russia might use nuclear weapons. The other said it might end up being a line of control. So if you have a line of control situation where you have a, 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 a basically the war stops, no one concedes ground, but Ukraine will say, say you're occupying my ground, um, I would still want it back, and you'd have skirmishes, firing, fighting, and it happens in many parts of the world as we speak right now, we have these lines of control where the official map is one thing, but the realistic map is another thing. Now that is a practical, not practical, that's a realistic outcome that might exist for years to come. Now nobody wants that. And the message we're sending out very clearly is we do not want Russia to be able to get away with this. In 2014, they walked into Crimea and nobody did anything about it. They walked into Georgia, nobody did anything about it. They took, went into Donbass and those regions, nobody's done anything about it. Now suddenly the world has woken up to this and we're worried about China and Taiwan. The message has got to go across that the West will unite. Now NATO is now stronger than ever. This has strengthened NATO. One week after, one week after the war started, as President CBI, I was invited by the EU ambassador and their weekly meeting they have where the EU ambassador gathers all the EU country ambassadors, 27 of them. They all meet for a meeting and they have a guest speaker at each of these meetings. I was the guest speaker, happened to be just after the war. And I asked the Sweden and Finland ambassadors, are you now going to join NATO? And they said, we're ready to join in five minutes. And what's happening? Sweden and Finland are going to join NATO. Do you know this is what Russia shot itself in the foot so badly, Finland has a 1,400 kilometer border with Russia, much more than Ukraine does. Finland can mobilize hundreds of thousands of troops. They have a, 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 a sort of volunteer system where hundreds of thousands of troops can be mobilized within weeks. <coughs> Finland is a highly sophisticated army and armed forces. Sweden is a huge defense manufacturer of fighter jets, uh, that are of, 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 of artillery, of super duper advanced defense equipment. So what is Russia doing? You've got two really powerful countries that have come, come on board, and Finland's had a war with Russia in history before. So this, is, this has to be a war that we've now got to go all the way and back the Ukrainians, and it means giving them planes. I said, by the way, we had a debate on Ukraine in, in, in December. I was the only peer that asked, why aren't we giving them aircraft? Now, Zelensky himself has come in and asked for that. Nobody asked that question, and now we're all talking about it. So my view is, and uh, Justin Majeski, if this is a war that is it's on all our behalf. This is all of us in the West. It's the whole of NATO now. And, and the threats of using chemical warfare, I've asked the question in Parliament, what if Putin uses a dirty bomb or nuclear weapons? Is NATO going to just stand back and say, we're only defensive, we can't do anything about it? Is the world going to stand back? In 2013, the Syrian... Parliament was recalled. Parliament was very rarely recalled. We were recalled and we were asked to intervene because chemical weapons were used in Syria. We did not intervene. What if we'd intervened then? What would have happened? Would ISIS have not have emerged in the way that it did and the terror that existed after that if we'd intervened then and we didn't intervene with hindsight? So I think this time, I think we're here to say we've got to make sure that Ukraine wins and Russia loses, um, in, in my personal view. And a lot of people in the <coughs> Parliament and the House of Lords 
would agree with that. Karen, thank you so much. Um, By the way, sorry, who would in this, I no. just want to test the audience. All right. who, would, who would agree with what I've just said about we've got to win this war um, and back all the way? Okay, thank you. Karen, thank you. Remind me of when we, slightly of when we had Lord Desai speaking here four or five years ago. And we sat waiting for him to start. And he then said, all right, well, what are your questions? And people were slightly surprised. He said, you think I've come here to work? You've come here to work. And I want to hear what your questions are before I get going. <laughs> you have epitomized what we try to do at the Institute, Karen, with your talk, which is to educate and inspire everybody, and in particular, tomorrow's leaders, people who will be working with this, the century of Asia during their working lives. Uh, we've been recording this. Others will listen to it, and I cannot thank you enough for touching on the sort of key points that people think about. Uh, and you remind me, I think, of what Churchill said, which was, never, 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 never give in. And you're that kind of person, and we are hugely grateful to you, you. for bringing your thought and your energy and your sharing your, all your knowledge uh, and beliefs. And I'm sure everybody's eternally grateful. So we'll give you, you a big hand. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.